of the Human Rights Campus Community Sustainability. We host these every month between all the different campuses and connecting all the different islands to begin discussing some of the important issues that are taking place at the island level. And today, one of the important issues that we're going to be focusing on is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The UN Sustainable Development Goals is actually a process that's being developed right now at the United Nations, and we're in the final year of negotiations. And so what has happened so far is that from the Rio Plus 20 meeting that took place in Rio de Janeiro two years ago, they decided to come up with new ways to measure and to focus on development, but really have sustainability at its core. And so the United Nations Association of Hawaii has actually participated and coordinated with the national UNA USA, and we were selected to be one of the local communities to actually have a sustainable development goals dialogue that then will go into the national information that then will be passed on to the UN. So right now, around the world, over 90 countries have had national and community dialogues to look at these sustainable development goals and see which ones we agree with and also to prioritize them and push them up. And what we have on the screen is the 17 goals where we're at right now. What happened last summer is in May, June, and July was the open working group. And that's just when all the governments come together and they had meetings every night until midnight, unfortunately. And they were able to finalize these 17 goals. And what we're going to focus on today is we'll actually look at these sustainable development goals and their importance here in Hawaii but also throughout the region in Oceania. And we'll discuss those. And then, of course, you can also vote. What we've been doing as well at the UN is we have our own site where everybody can vote on which sustainable development goal they think should be a priority. So we'll allow that voting. We've done that at uh, Children and Youth Day at the state capitol, and as well at other forums around Hawaii. So what we'll do really quickly is just go through some of the goals everybody knows what they are. We've abbreviated them. They're a lot longer and a lot more these. But these are the 17 right now. And what we're going to do is look at them here in the context of Hawaii and thinking about policies and practices that we could do to make sure we realize these goals. What will happen is there's actually going to be a sustainable development goal report that's issued. And governments will have to really report probably every four years on how they're meeting those. And what's different about this compared to what existed before was the UN Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, was they were trying to really do them from the community level up to the country and then up to global civil society. And the other point is to make sure everyone's held accountable. The Millennium Development Goals were just for developing countries, and there were only eight of those. And what they've tried to do is see what still exists and hasn't been met with the MDGs, incorporate those into these new Sustainable Development Goals but then also to have a more holistic perspective that embraces economy, ecology, and brings them both together, as well as looking at equality and equity. So this is what they are. Um, so far, this is what we agreed to as of July of this year. What will happen is between now and September of 2015, governments will still negotiate. So one thing that's important for us also is to put pressure on the United States to make sure that the United States actually doesn't delete some of the strong language, such as number 13 maybe, on taking urgent action to combat climate change, and making sure that we put pressure on our government to also negotiate in a positive way and, and not weaken them. So goal number one is ending poverty in all its forms everywhere, very similar to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Four Freedom speech that he gave. Goal two is ending hunger, achieving food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. I think that'll be featured a lot in today's talk, especially with what we're looking at here in Hawaii. Goal three, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all, at all ages. And of course, you can start seeing the connection and links between all of them. It's a very much an interconnected approach. Number four is ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. One of the reasons why we try to make sure University of Hawaii is engaged in the community and host these events not only to connect faculty and students across the system, but also to connect with civil society in all of our communities. Goal five is achieving gender equity and empowering all women and girls. We'll look at, at that today because today, of course, is November 25th, the day to end violence against women, and it starts the 16-day campaign.
that ends up on December 10th on Human Rights Day. There's something issued by the State Department that we'll look at there. Goal number six is ensuring availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all, which of course is quite crucial here in Hawaii. Goal seven, ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Very important, I think, a lot of the work being done here on campus as well. Goal eight is promoting sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. Goal nine is building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. Goal 10 is reducing inequality within and among countries. Goal 11 is making cities and human settlement inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Goal 12 is ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns, which is a really important issue that a lot of people were pushing at the, the negotiations. Goal 13, taking urgent action to combat climate change and its impact. Some people wanted to just put that underneath other goals, but they were able to agree to keep it at its own. Goal 14, very important here in Hawaii, is conserving and sustainably using the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development goals. This is being brought up, of course, with Hokulea as it travels around Oceania and the Pacific, but also when it starts going around the world. Goal 15, to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainable manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation, and halt biodiversity loss. Goal 16 is promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, providing access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. This is looking at rule of law, but also in having human rights as one of the focuses of this important work. And then goal 17 is strengthening the means of implementation and revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable development. So very similar to goal eight of the Millennium Development Goals. And what we thought we'd do here in Hawaii when we were selected was we've had a couple of different events. We started with a film festival at the Doris Duke Theater looking at was featured climate change. The, the key film was actually Phil Sony Heronico's film looking at Oceania and how climate change is being impacted around the Pacific Island states and the issues that they're facing. We also had the Children and Youth Day that was at the state capitol to raise awareness among our youth about the SDGs and allowing them to choose and vote which ones they are prioritizing. And one of our members, Chris, is doing a great job at compiling those. We also had UN Day on October 24th. And I know there's a great event in Hilo, and that's why we're really happy to combine today that way. And then, of course, here, on Oahu, we had a great event as well that was able to focus on the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the work of Eleanor Roosevelt, which was very much involved in many of these SDGs to try to make sure they were actually realized in the United States decades ago. And then, of course, we'll have this event, followed finally by an event on December 8th, where we'll actually have different people from the region of Asia and Pacific talking about Sustainable Development Goals and what they mean to them, focusing here in Hawaii, but also featuring over 10 countries in the Pacific and a couple countries in Asia as well. So this was our program kind of from International Day of Peace all the way to Human Rights Day. And today, of course, was important to bring students and faculty together as well as community leaders and elected officials to talk about the SDGs, not just in a theoretical sense, but why it's important here in Hawaii. So our first speaker that we'll have is our elected member of council on Kauai. Gary Hoosier has done a lot of progressive work here in Hawaii. Really, I would say an agenda that matches the Sustainable Development Goals in a very important way. And that's one of the important parts as well as engaging local officials as well as national to make sure that these SDGs aren't just something at the global level, but that they're part of our policy making and program decisions that we do here. Next, we'll have Hilo, UNA chapter, sharing the important issue of climate change in Oceania and looking at actually displacement already of people it, that climate change isn't something in the future, but actually something that people are facing now and already having to move, and the issue of internally displaced, as well as statelessness, and looking at climate change from a human rights-based approach. Then we'll have Don Peel sharing with us about the importance of having youth involvement in the decision-making and how the UN is looking at that. And then finally, we'll be looking at the important work of UH sustainability and what's taking place here, looking at, I think, the Plastic Free Week that just happened and other activities here at the University of Hawaii because we really have to start here and we always pick up a lot of 
habits in college, drinking coffee, doing different things, we might as well pick up sustainability and that can guide us throughout our work. One thing we were looking at as well was a, um, a challenge that exists across the country to actually take this green pledge and we're looking at maybe trying to do that system-wide where every student when they graduate actually takes this green pledge and we've done it at West Oahu as well as Maui and the great thing is when students do this they pledge that whatever graduate school they go to or whatever job they take they'll ask them how they incorporate sustainability into whatever future work they do and the exciting thing is any student that actually did it all of them got their jobs because they weren't just there like answering questions but they said is there any questions you have for us where most people are just like no I just want to get out of the interview and they're like actually I took a green pledge I really care about sustainability what does your company do and it ended up being a great uh, entryway for them to actually not just become a new employee but actually teach the employers about sustainability and get them to live a lot better and to reduce waste and to be more environmentally conscious so we'll look at all these things today and I really just want to thank everyone for participating, and I'll first hand it over to Gary Hoosier. Well, thank you. Mahalo. Thank good, you so much. Good afternoon, Joshua. Thank you very much, and aloha to those of you in the room and uh, around around our state, I guess. Yeah. The, I was, as I was listening to the, to the 17 different goals, I believe number 16 is, is one, but there should be somewhere in there grassroots democracy or, or rebuilding citizen participation. and, and I, I kind of heard that in number 16 and maybe interwoven between a lot of it because I think that's, that's a green component of this whole movement, the whole discussion. And as a county council member on Kauai, that's certainly been front and center for me and for our community this last uh, year or two, and actually around the state. As, as, uh, as you know and most of you who follow the news know, we've been involved in this uh, GMO corporate pesticide kind of discussion. Some would say a discussion, some would say a battle. And uh, I've been in the thick of it. And as we, as we look at these goals, they're, they're, they're all things that are near and dear to my heart. And working on the Kauai County Council, it became clear to me that, that this industry is uh, counter in, counterproductive to, all, to almost every one of them. Um, uh, just a, a brief description of that, if I could. Uh, on Kauai, uh, we have, uh, our, our agricultural community is dominated by four companies. And they dominated in, in their experimental uh, genetic GMO production, seed corn, whatnot. And on many levels, they, they dominate the, the landscape. So they actually displace real farmers and drive the rents up. For example, a, a person doing cattle ranching might pay $50 an acre. Uh, a person growing diversified crops that you would actually eat might pay $100 an acre. These companies are paying five, six, seven hundred dollars an acre. So the major landowners would much prefer to lease to them than they would smaller farmers. Uh, that, that's number one. Number two is they're using a tremendous amount of pesticides. Uh, and it's almost where Kauai and Hawaii is, is a third world country because many of these chemicals aren't, aren't legal in other countries. Uh, Syngenta is one of the primary uh, companies involved and Syngenta produces a chemical a pesticide called atrazine and atrazine is banned in Switzerland so you, you can't even use atrazine in their country but they're using it by the ton in my community and then you, you uh, open air testing you know if you're looking for biodiversity you're looking for sustainability you're looking for strong gene pools uh, in my opinion the genetic modification and, and monocropping weakens all of that and in Switzerland it's against the law to do open air testing of genetically modified organisms, but they're allowed to do it on Kauai. Uh, the Agribusiness Development Corporation, which is the primary manager of state lands, public lands, to be used for agriculture, 95% uh, of the lands they lease out are to these companies. And they produce no food whatsoever uh, for, for our state. Some could argue no food whatsoever, period. Uh, they do a lot of cattle feed and uh, corn, high fructose corn syrup. And if you look at that, health is, is one of these uh, goals. And I think most who study the health of people, certainly industrialized nations, would, would say that a big source of our problem is processed foods. And the core of processed foods is a high uh, fructose corn syrup, which these companies produce. So it's not, so we're, we're basically fighting that on a local level and really talking about local impacts. 
but there's the whole global impact, obviously, of, of uh, globalization of our food supply, uh, which, from what I've read and studied, re actually reduces the ability to, to feed the world. That most uh, of the information I've read is that it says the way to feed the world is through small farms located in those areas where the people eat the food, rather than doing it halfway around the world, uh, monocropping and spending all that energy to ship it around, around the world. And so those are some of the issues we're working on, and it's been a real battle. You know, these, these companies have a lot of money, and we're working uh, both in the courts as well as at the, at the, at the legislative level and the county council. One uh, legislative policy initiative that I'll be supporting is to take the Agribusiness Development Corporation and require them a mandate that they would provide at least 50% of the land for local food production. That sounds pretty reasonable to me that this is state land, it's public land, it's agricultural land. Let's use it to feed the people in our state uh, rather than use it for experimentation or, or other purposes. And I'm you know, happy to, to talk more or answer questions. Or Actually, I know there's one thing because we actually featured it, I think, last November when the, the vote really did come down. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you could just share, like, the idea behind the initiative okay. and the, the law that was proposed and then why it was proposed and then what was the response and then maybe we could do an update in the sense that Maui is like one year later but another initiative and maybe Hawaii was at the same time so we can yeah. discuss that and right. I think those deal very much with goal number two on ending hunger and achieving food security in an important way as well as the healthy living. And I'm happy to, I, I learned more about this industry and this topic in the last two years and been most doing a lifetime I think. Uh, so when I, two years ago when I got elected to the Kauai County Council, people in the community were, were telling me, Gary, we're concerned. We're concerned about pesticide use. We're concerned about GMOs. And so I started asking questions. And, I, and I'd call the companies in. to the, We'd meet the four or five companies, and I'd say, people are concerned. Tell me what pesticides you're using. And the companies would, first of all, say, no, we're not going to tell you. Then they would say that it's public information and it's not public information. And so the more I dug into it, the more I realized, the more I found out that these are very bad stuff. Uh, 22 different restricted use pesticides. Uh, real farmers don't hardly use them at all. I mean, Roundup, a lot of people use Roundup, but these are the really, the federally regulated, uh, they're using them by the tons. And so the more I found out, the more I, questions I had. And so I put together a bill working with the community. It literally started, and, and I'm very proud of this, that, that in people's living rooms. So we'd go, my young people between 35 or 25 and 35 would ask me for help, and I'd say, well, there's only so much I can do. And so through a series of living room meetings, we put together this, this piece of legislation that started at its core as disclosure, because if you don't know, you don't know. You don't know, you don't know how to deal with it. You don't really know how to examine the impacts unless you know what people are spraying and using. So we simply ask, tell us what chemicals, pesticides you're using, how much you're using, where you're using it, and telling us what crops you're growing. That's, that, that was a big component. Then, then there was a buffer zone component. If you're going to spray this bad stuff, don't do it next to schools, hospitals, houses, or sensitive environmental areas, streams, coastlines. And then it was, we're going to do a study. Now, once we have disclosure, we will study to see what the impacts are. Are, are the fears uh, grounded or are they not? And in the meantime, we do a temporary moratorium on expansion. So at, at the end of the day, the Kauai bill that passed, uh, it's disclosure, buffer zones, and a study. That's all it was. And uh, they sued us. The four companies, four of the largest chemical companies in the world sued our community for the right to spray poisons and not tell us about it. And they won the first round in court. Uh, BASF is the largest chemical company in the world, uh, the very largest one. Um, and so we, that was Kauai's venture into this, uh, this topic. And at the same time, or, or close to the same time, the Big Island then, the county council there, put in a ban on new, or on GMOs, period. You could not grow GMO, genetically modified organisms, in Hawaii County. Uh, the, diff the biggest difference, uh, uh, systemic difference is they're not grown, they're not based, these companies aren't based on the Big Island. So you might be growing papayas, you might be growing other crops, but these companies are not doing their research there. They're doing it on all the other counties. And so that, that law that they passed had relatively minimal economic impacts on these companies. So they, even though they're suing the Big Island too, they weren't as up in arms on that. And then Maui uh, 
put the icing on the cake, you know, and, and the, Shaka <laughs> the Shaka Initiative, and more power to them, you know, the, uh, it is such a testament, uh, regardless of the subject matter, people feel differently about whether it's a good measure or bad measure, but a grassroots initiative won against $8 million or more, uh, and $8 million spent more than any election in history in the state of Hawaii, and, and they lost. And the, the, the grassroots effort spent probably less than $100,000 over time. And that is uh, framed as a temporary moratorium, uh, but the bar is pretty high. So basically, the industry has to prove they're safe in order to be able to grow. And then there's a mechanism for proving they're safe. And so that's in court also. And so all, I started to say all three counties. Three of the four counties are in court now. And so we're waiting for the city and county of Honolulu to join us. Perfect. That's excellent. And it's, it's, this is happening all over the world, uh, you know, in different shapes and formats. Uh, a lot of the focus is on labeling of this issue, but to me, it's, it's really about small communities taking responsibility for themselves. And that's what it ended up. It starts out as being the industry, but really it's about these communities. You know, the, uh, Kauai spoke. We had a five out of seven council members voted. We overrode the mayor's veto to pass this law. They sue us. Maui, over half the population, over half the people voted, and they sue them. And it shows a couple of things. It shows this is not a fringe issue. This is not just my hippie friends on the North Shore. This is a, a mainstream issue. This is real. And to me, it's about impacts in our community. The industry likes to drag it into the science. Well, there's 100 studies that says you're not going to get sick from eating Doritos. Well, I'm not talking about eating Doritos. You know, I'm talking about impacts in my community, impacts on streams, impacts on environmental issues, impacts on people. There, there are so many unknowns, and I'll, and I'll just a couple examples. And um, we have medical doctors, obstetricians, pediatricians, who work in a hospital called, called KVMH, Kauai Veterans Memorial Hospital, which is in Waimea Town. This is a hospital surrounded by the fields, this community that's their major employer. And we had physicians testify, and they flat out said, we're not scientists, we haven't done peer-reviewed studies. But we've been delivering babies in this town for eight years, and we believe that we have 10 times the rate of certain congenital heart defects in newborns. So, and they, they flat out said, we don't know if it's GMO or it's pesticide, but we think there's a problem here. And to me, as, a, as an individual council member or as an individual, that's enough. I don't need more than that to, to look into it more and to, to put up some buffer zones and have some disclosure. The industry called it anecdotal and said, well, you have to prove it first. And the more you look into the, uh, what I would call the Aaron Brockovich situations, you never prove it enough uh, for these companies. Uh, you know, you never prove that this cancer was caused by this chemical sprayed in this field by this company. Everyone knows these chemicals are bad. Everyone knows people are getting sick, but to link it is very difficult. They keep you tied up forever. And so I believe at the end of the day, it's a political answer. It's a precautionary principle. It's people that make decisions can say, you know, I don't need more data. I have enough data for disclosure, for buffer zones. And if we want to support sustainability, we need to use that land to feed our people and not to just poison it over and over again. No, that's so. perfect. And that's one of the things that we're looking at is definitely seeing the SDGs as interconnected. And also the other important element is the human right element. And the first right is right to information. So that we have to have the right information to be able to make the decisions. And then, of course, it leads to the other aspects of self-determination to produce and determine our political status and pursue economic and social and cultural development. Mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely all linked up and a great example of the most important issue because, as you said, really, we do vote three times a day with what we eat. So democracy isn't only every four years with elections or two years on certain races, but it's every, every meal. And I think it's a really good example of Hawaii standing up and actually trying to live for sustainability and then some of the challenges that come with that. And also during the SDGs, the, uh, there's main groups. So you actually have youth, you have women, you have indigenous peoples, you have farmers and fisher folks. You also have corporations mm -hmm. and they're there as well, the International Chamber of Commerce. And they're very concerned with some of these. But the exciting thing is after the negotiations over two years, this is what we have now. And definitely goal number 16 looks at some of the points that you were talking about as well. And uh, what I thought we'd do now then is uh, first open up for just a couple of questions, but 
If there's anything immediately, because I know we have people on other campuses, if there's any immediate question related to that aspect of sustainable development goals, looking at goal two and three, and some of the other ones, if anyone has an immediate question, we'd definitely take that. And all you have to do is hit your microphone. And if there aren't any, then we'll go on to Hawaii Island to focus on an important issue. Definitely the most important sustainable development goal, of course, is being able to live where one is born and the issue of the Cataract Islands. But is there any questions first? Don. Yeah, I got a question. Okay, definitely over at West Oahu. Go ahead. Is that for me? Yep. Okay, uh, I'm glad the senator is here because I'm really interested to know what's going on. Uh, how did these guys uh, establish themselves in Kauai and now I think it's also in my neighborhood here in Royal Kunia? And a lot of us who are aware of the situation is kind of scared. Maybe we should start sealing our homes over there. So uh, we need uh, more uh, education as far as Siginta and all these outfits are, they are already here. We need some help. And I think the senator here have his eye on the, on the ball. And I was wondering if there's any way uh, uh, we can mobilize uh, the whole uh, Hawaii in this case. You know, this is practically, in my opinion, is an infiltration of our way of life here. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree, and thank you very much for the question and, and for your uh, consideration. Uh, you know, I served in the Hawaii State Senate for, for eight years, and uh, now I'm on the council, but I really enjoy doing the work that I do. Why, why, you you. Are, you're a senator, I think. Why did you guys allow these people to come in here? I mean, you well, are, I least, what, you are doing I, all I the think, laws here in Hawaii. How in a world that you are, you got clobbered? I, I think what happened is it's, it, they cre they creep Are you being, being bribed? <laughs> no, Has sir. Has there been you money uh, passed by and, and so that you get elected or something? No, I think right now the way the law works, is that there is virtually no regulation on farms. And mm. these companies call themselves farms rather than industrial experimental operations. Okay. On, Kauai, on Kauai, we just passed another new law where we created a separate category for experimentation. We, where they're different. We're taxing them differently. So I think, that, I think it just snuck up on a lot of the legislators. You know, the, on Kauai, there was one company that was Pioneer, then there was a second company, and it's a matter of scale. When they're only in 100 acres, nobody notices them. And now they're on 15,000 acres on Kauai, and, every, and all of a sudden it's, it's there. But uh, right now, I think it's, uh, I agree, it's a little bit too late in some respects, but we still need to be focused on the state legislature and on the county governments to step up to the plate and require at least disclosure and buffer zones for the pesticide use and I and I would argue to go a little deeper than that but at least at the minimum that uh, but uh, but they are they're really growing and, and you know they're a lot of their they talk about the jobs but a lot of the jobs are done through uh, contractors the Kelly services type of thing where they're not really full-time employees they're seasonal employees and they're not even employees of those companies uh, they're non-union uh, ILWU tried to organize them and wasn't able to do it. Uh, and the, the worker safety is another big, big issue. I've talked to workers who have, have told me stories, just like we're talking here today, about mixing chemicals and corn seed by hand without mm. gloves. Uh, and, and then they got sick. Uh, but, but I agree, sir, it's, it's an important issue. And unfortunately, they did creep in and get established uh, before we uh, were able to regulate it properly. So, good question, but it's important to see, of course, the issues that are being taken up. And in this case, uh, the council member now in Kauai was pushing for these bills to then, of course, actually recognize our basic human rights and, more importantly, try to get the right information out there. So definitely good questions. And spirited, as I always appreciate, from West Oahu and important to focus there on the leeward coast about what's going on out there. Most people don't focus on Kapolei enough, but there's a lot of things happening. So. I definitely think good points. Any last follow-up? Yeah, Professor, I'm very concerned about this because uh, 
I don't know how uh, the way I know Hawaii before is no longer the Hawaii that I know uh, right now. And so I think uh, for some reason uh, we got to uh, regroup somehow and see what the problem is exactly. I, I, I'm a taxi driver and I have a lot of these guys riding on me and they are telling me all kinds of horror stories that there's some doctors going in there checking all their health situation. And, and so, uh, and most of these are Filipinos. I'm a Filipino, and I'm very much concerned about this because, you know, it's the breed of life, of course, but, uh, you know, their means of living because they have no more farm of their own. But the point is, are they being taken care of properly? And on the, on the other side issue here, I want to ask if, what is the role of the university in this case, Professor? Where do you stand on this? Okay. Go? The, the, first of all, I would say that the, the reason we were able to move these issues forward on Kauai, Maui, and in Hawaii County was because the citizens, the people in the community demanded it. They came up to me and said, we, we want you to do this and we want to help. And so I'd be happy to work with you and others in the, in the community to, to, in any way I can. So that's, that's number one. Number two, the University of Hawaii uh, College of Tropical Agriculture uh, and the Farm Bureau and the Department of Agriculture all have a bias toward big ag. That's just the way it is. I mean, I can't say any, any other way than that. We all have our biases. Uh, they are biased toward big ag and toward technology. And we have to figure out a way to, to change that bias or at least get some equal ground uh, to other uh, forms of agriculture. Uh, secondly, one of my biggest disappointment from as a, as a politician, as a senator, as a council member, as an activist in the community is the lack of involvement by University of Hawaii students and faculty out there in the community. I mean, you might get it in the classroom, but I don't see it in the community. I don't see it at the legislature, and I'd like to help facilitate that and try to, to, to make that more, too, because there's a tremendous amount of power and influence in, in, the, in this campus and in campuses all over, and we need to somehow uh, organize that and, and, and motivate students. I don't know if, if everyone's just too comfortable or, or, or what the deal is. No, no, I think it definitely comes up in most of the classes that I teach. We talk about the issue of sustainability. We always have Earth Day events. We actually are on our 15th annual Earth Day event called Ecological Ethics, Activism, Justice. And each one of those always has a component. We actually started it on Maui. We actually brought uh, Kasawa from Burma. And he was the one that mm. brought the case against uh, Unical and Texaco for the pipelines they were laying, connecting all the environmental and human rights issues. So it's definitely a big, important part. I agree that the university does tend to go towards the larger side. And students and faculty, I think that's one of the things we should do. Uh, we always have service learning in class as well for you to get out there and try to test some of your theories you, we talk about in class and to take action. And there's definitely been a lot of work that has been done. Uh, Center for Hawaiian Studies, of course, is doing probably taking on the largest share with the GMO testing of the Kahlo and work by Walter Ritti as well. And I think a big action, of course, was last year in January when Vandana Nashiva came out from India. We had a standing room only and really did a lot of community work and talks around the, the entire state of Hawaii as well. So there's much more that needs to be done. But I would agree that faculty and students could be out doing a lot more. And we'll hopefully uh, discuss that as well with one of our speakers as we get close to the end. There's a lot of things going on. And we should have a very much more vibrant group at West Oahu campus and other campuses as well. So mm. we'll just stop there then. And I, I want our, our uh, great group at UNA Hawaii over in Hilo to be able to share the story of climate change and its impact on the Cataract Islands, if that would be OK. I, I had a question. Sure. You have to prove it. My name is Jane Panic. I live in Hilo. I'm a former college professor. You mentioned the Green Pledge. It seems to me if the students were doing that at graduation, it would engender a lot of interest and it would make the community more aware. It's discouraging uh, what you say about the universities not being involved. And I'm afraid too much of that is tied up with monies they might be getting for research. 
Are there universities that opt out of that money? Mm. There's actually some great programs. They have a monthly program out of Bard College, and it's connected also with 350.org. And they're doing monthly seminars on the most important sustainable development goals issues around the country and around the world. And they work a lot with Bill McKibben. And I definitely think the Green Pledge would be something that's small. I know when I graduated, everybody was so impressed with, like, what tassels did you have and what were they for and what honors are done. And so, you know, a simple, cool green button or one of the green tassels that everyone who takes the pledge would, people would want that. They want some graduation swag, but we can make it meaningful and not just, you know, selfies, but selfies with substance where they take the pledge as part of the actual graduation. And we could actually probably launch that through either the uh, student caucus or through the great work of, that's being done on sustainability across the UH system. But it's just one small program. But I agree, it's symbolic, but it could start things. And in the classes that we've done that in, like I said, students were actually getting more employment by actually mentioning the environment. And I think we could look at doing that systematically. It was just one thing I found with the founder of it and talked with them about it. And they said, could you try to do it on a couple of campuses where you're teaching? And a couple of valedictorians were in my class. So then they did it as part of their, their speech. But I do agree we could do it systematically and do it a lot better as well. So we'll definitely look at that. And maybe that'll be one of the results of our sustainable development goals community consultation we're having is that we'll include that uh, system-wide. Is, so you, you is yes. there a way we can get a copy? Is there a way? How about all? We could. I'll email that to uh, Ruth, if that's OK, with the link. And then uh, how about let's aim for our April one that we do with HITS. We'll make that uh, the pledge. Hopefully, we'll see how far we got by then. How's that? That's great. And we can try to include it in May graduation. OK. I guess Thank that's you. OK. You're welcome. Uh, we'll now uh, include our two featured speakers that we really thank for coming, because I know that they actually teach and have other things to do at this time. But we really right. were pleased to have two chapters doing UNA activities on October 24th, and we just wanted to feature. And that's the idea, too, of this interactive dialogue between the islands, is that not only everything comes from Oahu, but that all the campuses and islands can uh, can generate the content and uh, spearhead the conversation. I would like to introduce Steve Hanks and Jacinta Helen, who are from, um, well, they'll tell you where they're from and what their project is. And we're so happy to have them today. And thank you. And they took off time from their jobs. They at took off time from their jobs. and. I hope you're getting paid vacation <laughs> So I think our microphone is on. Can you it's hear us over there? there? over here. OK. Yep. We, we did have some slides. Um, I see your uh, computer is on the screen. I'm not sure uh, if we can organize that or not, because it's not my strength. But uh, anyway, we can they just will. talk, if, if nothing else. Because I've seen your slides when you were practicing during the oh, video. You did. So they should switch it in the back. And I saw oh. some stunning uh, okay. natural beauty of oh, the yeah. Pacific. Yeah, let me just so uh, quickly just see if there's anyone back there. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be no, able you to. need help? <laughs> if you want to just keep talking, we'll uh, arrange that on both sides, OK? Just OK, great. Um, well, greetings. And uh, um, you know, thank you again for having us. Uh, come on uh, today and share a little bit of our story. Uh, my name is Steve Hanks, and this is Jacinta Helen, my wife. And we have uh, uh, been teaching at Honoka'a High School here on the Big Island for the past, uh, well, almost 20 years now. We came in uh, 90, uh, I think this is my 20th year at Honoka'a. Uh, but I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Papua New Guinea in the early 90s. And uh, both of us were teaching there. Um, and Jacinta happens to be from this little atoll in Papua New Guinea called the Cartret Atoll. And so um, really, the, the story of climate change has been part of our married life for, 
for all these years and and of course for her life um, you know for the past almost 50 years now um, so we came to tell our story and our friends here in uh, Hilo invited us back just to share a little bit I know we're kind of short on time uh, you have to 130 so we're okay you know you yeah, have okay. some time as well you have two others okay. so it's fine okay great um, yeah. Our technical person is not here, so I can't. Uh, I'm not is sure. Your, is that your computer? Yeah. yeah. It's Maybe. it's plugged in, but it's. Uh, no problem. They're gonna call from here, so if you just want to talk slowly. Yeah. And, okay. You know, begin discussing a little bit. We have the right. technical people here calling there, so. Okay. Great. And I did see it up before, so I'm pretty sure it'll it'll yeah. come up. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, uh, so we have uh, just a few more things about us. Um, uh, we have two uh, daughters that we uh, have adopted. They're also from the atoll. They're relatives of Jacinta's. Uh, they are in uh, fifth grade and eighth grade here in Honoka'a. Um, and then we also raised uh, Jackson. So we've had, uh, and he's graduated from Honoka High School in 2004. So we've been kind of longtime members of our community. We've been giving this presentation in various forums for the past uh, 20 years and uh, just have received a lot of support from our community um, in Honoka and then of course now with our group here in Hilo. But the, the story for this uh, presentation really was, you know, just sharing a little bit about this one specific case where teachers, I'm a math teacher, Jacinta teaches in a special education uh, classroom. Uh, we're not scientists about climate change. It's just kind of uh, our observations over the years and uh, just kind of telling the story of this one particular group of people. Uh, that of course we know very very well and I think what you can kind of take away from it might be just kind of how um, there's so many islands and so many groups of people but you know here's just kind of one uh, uh, case study so the goal really uh, you know the, the story of the Carteret Island really begins with um, the beginning of the plantation uh, and in uh, about a hundred years ago or more um, it, it it's such a unique story because you have uh, foreign occupation that has taken place for much of the history of the last hundred years followed by a war the Bougainville crisis and uh, the struggle of the people to have uh, be independent oh we got some technical support coming in and then optimistically now just recently uh, the resettlement of this group of people and their um, uh, as they now have looked to some of the other uh, islands specifically the main island of Bougainville to resettle the people there um, and that's kind of the story that we're hoping to tell here all right. Hey. There we great. go. So, um, Thank you. you know what we're going to have to do, though, is you're going to have to help me turn the slides, and then you, when you have a few things to say that you can. Uh, so Jacinta's going to help with the manual slide turning. Can you see the picture of the? Oh, we're you can. Absolutely okay. clear right now. So we're ready okay, to go great, together. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. All right. So let me keep track of time here so the first question yeah, is about, um, go ahead. Uh, the first really question is kind of where is it so um, the Cartridge Atoll is in Papua New Guinea um, we fly here from Honolulu Hilo to Honolulu to to Brisbane Australia up to the capital city of Port Moresby and out to the uh, to the province of uh, what was the North Solomons, which is now the autonomous region of Bougainville. And towards the north of that island of Bougainville, you see Buka Island. And 
making a 45 degree angle out from the Buka Passage, if you can see that, 70 miles out is this little atoll called, on that map that you see there, the Tulin uh, Islands, but uh, uh, that's, and that's their local name for it, but if you looked it up on Google today, you'd find it as the Carteret Atoll. You zoom in on Google Maps, you see this atoll, it has about uh, five or six, I think, actually six islands, now seven, because they, one of them has actually literally been split into two. And our uh, atoll, Pule Island, is in the, at the very bottom, kind of right. Um, the population of the atoll, Jacinta would claim to be a couple thousand people, but I mean, I'm thinking on our little island here of Pule, there's probably 200. So I'm thinking there's probably actually only about a thousand people that actually live on the atoll at any given time. But this slide right here, uh, taking off of Google Maps, I think just, you know, um, gives me really compelling evidence that this island is shrinking. I mean, we've watched it over the last 20 years in Jacinta for almost 50 years, but just looking at this slide, you can see, to me, where it was at some point in time and where it is now. Um, the homes that you're seeing on the slide there are facing the lagoon, and, uh, but you can kind of, to me, kind of see how that shape is, and if we have time to see some of the other slides, you'll see a lot of the erosion that has taken place. So, you know, very unscientific as to how much land has been lost, but it's been significant. And um, and to me, from this image, it looks like it's it's really, uh, uh, you know, less than half of what, what it was at one point. So, uh, if you could go back a slide. I just wanted to have Jacinta just say a few things at this point, um, as I can kind of ask her to um, can you t just talk into that microphone? Can they hear you from there? I think so. Can you hear Jacinta from there? Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. great. Oh. So um, I just wanted her to tell a few stories about, you know, when did they first realize that the island was kind of disappearing? Well, um, many of the people on my island didn't really know anything about climate change. They had not heard anything about it, but they've seen and they have experienced uh, the coastline eroding. And um, they, the island people have been very superstitious. There's lots of witchcraft and superstition. And so when they saw the coastline being eroded, you know, their belief was, oh, there's, there's uh, sorcery going on. And, and uh, someone from the next island is doing some black magic to get our coastlines away. And um, some people to this day still believe that, but many of the people are becoming more aware of climate change and they're listening more to the news so they know there's something to do with global warming and climate change that's impacting the, um, the islanders and their their food crops, their land. I know that um, at least every two years we have to move our houses inland because the, the water is right there. Um, the waves are crashing right in the front of our houses. The um, highest elevation on most of our six islands are only about three feet or less. So you know in, in, uh, when it's high tide, uh, that the water just comes over. You can see it seeping from the uh, uh, out from the uh, uh, ground or the sand. So even in the interior of the islands, there's water seeping out because it's the the water sea level is so high. And um, so. Um, ever since I was young, I used to hear people say, oh, uh, people used to come for vacation from the main island of Bougainville or Papua New Guinea, and they would say, wow, where's the tree that used to be here? Where, where are the houses that used to be here? So that's that kind of um, 
you know, made me aware that there was there was uh, land being lost to the sea. And the sea is like our garden. You know, we that's where we get our food. And uh, the basic staple food of all the islands there in the Cartridge Atoll is coconut and fish. And even now in 2014, there's coconut trees being washed away. There's uh, bananas, there's no more gardens. And uh, I'm hoping if we have time, we can see some of the slides of how the interior of the islands look like. And you can really see the loss of garden lands, which is why our resettlement program is, uh, is, has been started and we're trying to encourage more people to move out of the island. I think they can actually see you. From they, there, oh, so. Well, I don't have. That. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, so just to give you a little context of our res uh, story about the resettlement, uh, um, let's go to the next slide. The next two, actually. So, any history of uh, of kind of where we're going with the resettlement uh, project has to go back to kind of the history of of. Uh, the economy of Bougainville, uh, which was cacao. Um, uh, like I said, in 1902, I think it was, the first uh, plantation came in Bougainville. Of course, it was the Catholic mission created these huge plantations uh, with these, and they're still there, uh, although they're in disrepair right now. But with the copra, the, the uh, coconut plantation, and then in the, the lower level of the plantation was, of course, the cacao, using the labor source of the people, um, all the way up until the, uh, 1942 when Bougainville was occupied by Japan. After the war, uh, Australia was operating, uh, was uh, administering the country of Papua New Guinea, so of course Bougainville was involved in that. But this cacao was the backbone of the rural economy. That's where the, everyone in the province basically got their income was by selling their uh, cacao. It was critical income for you know, thousands and thousands of people. And the location center of where the people from the Cartridge Atoll are now moving was this area of Tinputs, which was the hub back in the uh, 80s of um, this huge, you know, very fertile land, this, this uh, hub of the cacao uh, agriculture. Can you go to the next slide? So just to give you an indication, um, up from, from the um, uh, time of independence in 75, up until the Bougainville crisis, this war that took place in the late 80s, Bougainville, you can see in this slide, was that dark blue line. Um, and the second largest producer of cacao is the dashed line below of East New Britain. And you can just see how that economy was booming. Um, it was the largest producer, producer of cacao uh, in the country. And then you see the devastating loss uh, as you go into the early 90s when, when I started to learn about the um, the country. And then if you go to the next slide, um, the other background piece of information of this uh, area is uh, this huge mine, the largest mine in, the, in that area in the South Pacific um, called uh, Bougainville Copper Limited. That was the name of the company that operated the mine. Um, it first started drilling in 1964 and during its years of operation this mine was exporting 44% of Papua New Guinea's exports of the entire country coming from this one mine. It was basically, it seems like, bankrolling the country, the, the establishment of, for independence of this country of Papua New Guinea. 62% of the mine's income was going to the Papua New Guinea national government that was just forming in the 1970s. 33% was going back to the company, um, which was, of course, an Australian uh, foreign investors, maybe not all Australia, I'm not sure. 4% was going to the Bougainville provincial government, and only 1% was going to the landowners. 
So if you go to the next slide, in 1983, there wasn't as much concern about climate change because the economy was booming and all the people were working. If you look at that far bar graph in the far column, that's Bougainville, the North Solomon's prof, uh, province. Four times the uh, per capita income than any other province in the country. Plus, the mine is funding the capital city, which is that other bar, uh, the National Capital District. So incredible economy. You've got this agriculture booming. You've got this uh, mine booming. And, and uh, the people of Bougainville are living um, with the highest per capita income than any other uh, group in the country, if you could hit the next slide, until the late 80s. So they have this secessionist uh, armed conflict against the uh, uh, Papua New Guinea government, established about environmental issues, essentially. They're taking over the mine. They're shutting down the mine. It has destroyed their... Uh, their uh, environment, the landowners are only getting 1% of the income, and they're saying, no, uh, you know, we don't want any of this. It's devastating to the entire region. Um, it goes on for almost 10 years. Um, if you could go back just for a slide there. Uh, 15 to 20,000 Bougainvillians died during the conflict. The economy uh, it, it goes down to, um, at one point, just before I arrived as a Peace Corps volunteer, it was under naval blockade. Nothing came in or out of that entire province for, I think it was a year. And then as uh, the early 90s kind of turned the corner there, they started opening up. But the, you know, we're 30 years in now, and it's still, we were just there this summer, and it's still... Um, just taking baby steps to get their economy uh, going. So that's kind of the backdrop of how what was going on all this time while this island was disappearing and disappearing and disappearing. All the people in, in, in 1989 go back to Australia, go back to the main island of Papua New Guinea, and all the Cartwright Islanders that were working in all these different areas go back to the Cartwright Atoll where now the pinch of no food, no land, no economy just starts to really start to really, uh, not just at that atoll, but all the other atolls in the area. They really start to feel the, the pinch of, uh, of their life. So at this point, let's just look at some slides. Jacinta can kind of take through what it's like today. This is this summer. We were just there uh, for a couple months of what it's like to be a Cartwright Atoll uh, uh, person today. Yeah, let me uh, tell you a little bit about, um, about the people of the Cartwrights. They live very simple lives. They wake up in the morning, they go to church, they have church twice a day, and the rest of the day they do their best to look for food. The children go look for firewood. Those who are going to school, go to school. And many of the young men and women go fishing because they have to, to go and look for food to eat for tonight and the next day. Um, some people go and look for firewood. That's all they use. And firewood is very scarce now because um, the, many of the big trees that used to be on the island are now dead um, because the salt was just too much. And um, there's no electricity on the island, so they cannot, you know, have dairy. They don't have dairy. They don't have studies. The students don't have studies at night because there's no light. Um, the classrooms that are in the village are built out of um, um, traditional material, coconut leaves and uh, sago palms. Uh, the same with the village houses. Uh, as you can see in this picture, there's uh, the young boy is looking for coconut for the whole family for the evening meal or for the next day. Um, and the coconut is a very important resource to the islanders 
because they use it as food, of course, building material for their houses. Um, they weave the leaves for plates and, and um, uh, other baskets to put their food in because there's, uh, there's not too many plates and cups and spoons. Um, they're still happy. I mean, they have a very difficult life. Sometimes they go without food for many, many days. Uh, if it rains and strong winds, they cannot go fishing. And so, and the coconut is not as productive as it used to anymore. So um, sometimes the, the kids will just drink a glass of water and go to bed. Um, and the mothers will go to bed, you know, with no food, no water, because they save all the food for their kids. Uh, there's a lot of fishing that goes on because that's the main food, of course. And our main um, mode of transportation is this little boat, speedboat, that travels 70 miles from the main port of Buka on the main island of Bougainville to the Cutrets, um atolls. 70 miles away. This picture where these kids are standing, that's where our houses used to be. And now it's all, this is low tide, so you see some water there, some of the ocean. Uh, but this is where our houses used to be. And it's, it's, uh, we have lost a lot of land. And I have seen this in my life you know from when i was young till now i every time i go back there's uh, a coconut tree falling down or, or a pandanus tree we have very few nut trees now that grow on the island and it makes it very hard for uh, families to feed everybody you can see these kids they are they are little stomachs protruding out, it's uh, malnutrition because there's no vegetables that grow anymore. The, the land cannot sustain any gardens. Uh, this is an example of a classroom that I was talking about. The, the students don't have desks. They sit on the sand. And uh, we send school supplies from Hawaii with our, our Honoka community and the other communities in Hawaii have been very supportive and we've collected school supplies and we send them to the uh, village schools and they they are very happy they are very happy that they have their traditional classrooms and paper and pencil they still the village people still carry on their traditions this is a boys' ritual, uh, and and because they have these kinds of rituals, they they can deal with climate change a little bit. You know, in, instead of being depressed all the time about not having food, not having building materials for their houses, or having very little mm. thing to do, they can still have their rituals. And, and be I was going to add to this slide too that. The Cartridge Atoll is one of the only places where that cultural aspect is still going on. It's law, it used to be on the island of Bougainville, but it's no longer being practiced there. So when we lose our little islands, we lose those uh, cultural practices that may not carry with it uh, over to the, uh, to the new re relocation uh, site. And there's, there's Steve. He participated in the boys' ritual this summer. <laughs> and we fed the whole village for three weeks. All the 100 to 200 people on this island, we, we brought in rice and flour and sugar and meat and pork and fed everybody for this time so they were happy because they had some, some food. Um, you can see the rocks there, that's the land uh, that was lost, and now it's only the rock foundations on the coastlines of the islands. You can uh, see the other islands in the distance. 
They are all facing the same problem of losing their shorelines. Um, this is us feeding the people. And when we left, they went hungry again. Uh, we're just gonna run quickly past these slides. There's the kids who we um, worried about the most, so we made sure they they had some rice. Oh, uh, I think we'll skip that one. We're running a little bit short. Uh, okay. We had a little video clip here, but it's alright. I've seen that one. That's a really good one. I know um, we do appreciate all the points about the saleization and the destruction, of course, where no crops can grow anymore because it's the seeping underneath. We've heard about that. And we really appreciate all the insight about what's happening to the island. So definitely please keep sharing a little bit, and then we'll have our last two speakers. But yeah. the slides are great, and thanks for the firsthand Let's accounts the for what's happening with climate change. Project. It's not going to the... Oh, okay. Next, next, next. You want to talk about this? Uh, just a slide here about uh, that's what the interior of the island is looking like now. Uh, the water comes up through the middle. The gardens area was there. You, obviously, it's devastating. They're uh, building seawalls to protect the land. This one here is made out of giant clamshells, which are just like that, they're very, very big. And this is me in, uh, sitting on top of that seawall. So you see elevation's about six feet. It is entirely because of that seawall. Okay, so just before we close here, I definitely want to talk a little bit about the resettlement. Um, uh, the story of this resettlement really uh, is a wonderful story about this particular woman. Her name is Ursula. Rakova, she's the executive director of Tulele Pesa, uh, which she just received the United Nations uh, Equator Prize. Uh, Jacinta and Ursula went to New York City, and uh, Ursula was awarded this prize at the Lincoln Center, and we were just absolutely thrilled um, that her efforts have been recognized. Uh, uh, not just in that award, but in, in other um, grants as well. Um, the project is really to resettle the, the islanders. Um, um, and she's traveled the world trying to solicit money and trying to make this project happen. She's just worked absolutely tirelessly to make that happen. But what is amazing about where she's at right now is that basically she has almost kind of put aside her trying to cater to all of the grants and basically has just tried to open up her own cacao um, uh, export business. So basically she is now trying to go back to where they were uh, in their economy, um, recognizing that if they reclaim that Catholic uh, plantation land under their own uh, project, that they can clear the land, get the cacao going again, use the export money from the cacao to pay the farmers that will be coming from the Cartridge Atoll to this location and um, so that they'll have some cash income like they had before. And, um, and then some of the money from that export that she will then use to uh, build the infrastructure that they will need the extra classrooms in the schools, uh, the hospital needs an upgrade, and various uh, uh, parts of the infrastructure there. So we're very, very excited. We were just there. We spent a week at the location. Um, that's an image right there of a typical house. It has some Western uh, uh, framing. Uh, the roof is uh, just like our uh, tin roof here, where they can collect water into a um, into a uh, um, water, tank. water tank. But the th thatched roof um, siding matches kind of the local community that you would find there in tin puts. Um, so they're trying to kind of balance out that. That's a 
uh, landscaping shade cloth there or greenhouse shade cloth that they're using as a window. Um, and it's being built by the local tin puts uh, um, uh, builders. So they're really trying to incorporate the, the, um, the local people in their community, trying to match this new uh, um, uh, community with the surroundings and use that old economy of the cacao now run by the um, uh, by the Cartridge Islanders that are going on. So they're going on to this Catholic mission land. So the, to the Catholic Church is basically um, allowing them to reclaim that mission land that I spoke of uh, at the very beginning. So the first location site has been has been, uh, uh, they've got eight houses on the first location site. Phase two will be coming up soon where they'll get another, you know, 10 to 15 homes. There's a grand total of five relocation centers, one for each of the islands of the atoll. And unfortunately, this is just one atoll out of, of course, thousands in the South Pacific, but it's the story of what I think can happen and is happening right now, uh, and we're very, very optimistic. And really, I have to say, optimistic for the first time in 20 years. I mean, it's been a really tough uh, um, thing to watch over the last 20 years, but what we saw this summer was very exciting. I saw lots of food, enough food that we could carry it back with us when we went back to the atoll. Space, uh, school, um, just um, peace, um, a lot of factors that I, I'm very uh, excited about, you know, moving forward. Thank you both. That's an excellent presentation. It's, I actually was at the Lincoln Center. We were there for the People's Climate March on oh. that Sunday. And then we know that Monday was the uh, ceremony at Lincoln Center. And, of course, we also had another Pacific Islander, which we featured, Kathy, who was a UH Manoa graduate who gave the closing at the opening with her speech to her child and I got a standing ovation from the rest of the, the world leaders to actually realize and put a human face on what's happening yeah. regarding climate change. So that's a perfect connection and link there. And we really do appreciate the examples also of resilience and adaptation strategies that are being incorporated by Pacific Islanders. I think we're looking at that happening in Tuvalu as well as Kiribati and excellent examples of the giant clam wall was also appreciated as well. Uh, we'll go to our next speaker who's going to talk about sustainability issues here at UH and what's taking place there. And then we'll have some questions towards the end. And uh, that'll round out our sustainable development goals here in Hawaii and Oceania. And we'll move forward. But thank you, everyone, so far for all their contributions. Hi, um, I'm Kristen Jameson. I'm sorry, yeah. Great. Um, I'm Kristen Jamison, and I'm representing um, a student organization called Sustainable UH here at UH Manoa. And we're an umbrella organization kind of designed to help empower students to take on initiatives of their own. Uh, recently this week, we just uh, did a Plastic Free Week as an awareness campaign to hopefully create some behavioral change and provide students with resources so that they can create better habits by bringing their own bottles, bringing their own utensils, and really just being mindful of single-use plastics and their huge impact on the environment. Um, and really getting some information out there about the fact that it takes two gallons of water just to make one 16-ounce bottle and that 17 million barrels of oil a year are used to fund the plastic industry. Um, and so, yeah, it was a really good campaign. We introduced our plastic water bottle ban, which we got over 1,000 signatures in a week, so that was really great. Um, and the whole goal of that is to ban plastic water bottles here at UH Manoa. Um, as a statement that university does not find this consumption to be in line with their sustainability policy and mission of the university. Um, one thing that we are really trying to do is get more student involvement and more student activism. Uh, this is actually my first year with the organization and I've found that through sustainability efforts it has offered me great professional development as well as personal development, a great sense of meaning. Um, and community interaction and really getting to know members of your community. And so I think it's really important that we foster 
a university system that really promotes activism and promotes students leading their own initiatives. Um, <laughs> can't think of too much else to say. That's great. Yeah. That, uh, that definitely talks about the one SDG on sustainable consumption. These are good examples of the sustainable consumption SDG as well as the climate change SDG and why these are absolutely vital. And it's important here in Hawaii. Uh, the other thing that I thought was kind of important to mention briefly as well is, is on our screen here, the, uh, the campaign that's launching today, the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender Violence with International Day to End Violence Against Women. That'll start today. It'll be a 16-day campaign that will actually go all the way in through December 10th. So this is one action they're doing with UN Women with, uh, it says you're invited to orange your neighborhood. And looking, there's of course a statement by Secretary of State Kerry. But this is one campaign that students are organizing and doing at West Oahu campus and other campuses to focus on that sustainable development goal in many ways. And then I thought, if there's any question for our two speakers that just happened, let's uh, open that up and then um, wrap up with a couple of uh, brief statements about what's going around the world related to the important issues of sustainable development goals. OK, any questions? If not, then we'll have one presentation that's also looking at the UN and youth participation in the United Nations. And, and Don Peel will talk about that. Or I'll click it if you want. And so what we really can look at as well then is the important aspect of youth involvement in sustainable development goals. And they're, of course, one of the major group holders that participate as well. And of course, there's a, one more event that happened that was kind of big at the UN. That was um, the UN Review of the United States at the Committee Against Torture. A lot of issues were brought up there, and I think that's kind of an important thing that you can look at that'll come out on Black Friday. The, the report will actually be released. So here's the slideshow that uh, Don will share as well, talking about youth participation, the UN and human rights. Yeah, I, I thought I'd start out with sort of the going back and sort of seeing the evolution, the advancement of the United Nations, because uh, that whole thing started because of the atrocities of the war, the wars, and uh, the Declaration of Human Rights came out in 1948. Go ahead. Oh, go back, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Getting way ahead of me here. And uh, actually what, no, go ahead. Yeah. The environmental aspect actually didn't come out till 1964 when Rachel Carson uh, published uh, her Silent Spring, uh, which was uh, about the DDT, uh, side effects of industry. Go ahead. And it wasn't until, it wasn't, no, I'm, <laughs> it wasn't until 1972 that the UN actually uh, brought it to a global scale, and that was through the environmental program. And then it uh, escalated up into the Birtland Report, which was our common future, which actually mixed in development with environment. That came out in 1987. Uh, and this is to do with the whole sort of paradigm shift where you go from the thinking economics, and you do the balance between economics, this, um, uh, environment, and, and the social aspect where you get sustainable development in the, at the middle. So you take all three. Um, and that came out in 1992 at the Earth Summit. Agenda 21 was an inclusive glo global com community where there was 178 countries that ratified this Agenda 21. And within Agenda 21, you, you saw the, um, a real important point on the strengthening roles of major groups. And there you see women on top, children and youth, and indigenous people were um, traditionally never in the mix of policy making uh, of global and even at local levels. So. Um, the United Nations got together their um, 
at the Millennium Summit develop those uh, Millennium Development Goals that which end next year and we, we've heard about those. And then uh, the UN also to, to sort of intensify this movement towards the paradigm shift declared 2005 to 2014 as the decade for education for sustainable development. And then at the Rio Earth Summit, which was Rio plus 20 in 2012, as Joshua mentioned, they, they really wanted to do a more bottoms up approach. And the latest report coming out of the UN is this power of 1.8 billion. This is the number of people between the age of 10 and 24 years of age that have a real key to transform and, and take the, the destiny, their destiny into their hands. So this is a great resource to, to really um, focus on. And then going back to the United, United Nations Association is a national grassroots network that's actually worldwide but the U.S. Has, has really supported what the U.N. is doing. And there's local chapters, um, <clears throat> which happens to be a local chapter here and in Hilo. Um, and the whole aspect of uniting the world with Aloha is, is sort of the deal. And these are some of the things that we're actually getting into. Um, there's, there's many things that people can be involved with with the United Nations Association. And here locally, we're doing the Model UN, we're doing the World Youth uh, Congress, we're doing Children and Youth Day, Education Energy, World Peace Plan, and also this, um, the world we want, where we're putting direct input into the UN. Now, I wanted to mention real briefly with regards to uh, what's coming up next year is the Generations United is a group out of Washington, D.C. They're bringing uh, their annual conference here in July, and it's going to be inter intergenerational action on a global scale. And we feel this is a real sort of segue to get all these um, local things happening and, and tied together. And... Um, this is sort of the makeup of the conference, and I think there's things in, in here that people in our audience should get the word out, because uh, here we've got a youth summit that we're exploring Hawaii as an international youth center, where we can actually uh, tap into this, this international 1.8 billion people. So <clears throat> if you can see sort of some sort of fit and the United Nations Association um, the Worldwide Voyage or the uh, Standing Up for World Peace. Yeah, definitely my email address is up there and uh, give me a, a shoot of email to me and I can connect you. Thank you, Don, for bringing in the uh, youth component. Uh, good news is we have just a couple of minutes left, around four, that we could still have some questions and comments if anybody has any questions for any of the speakers from today. We're able to have youth represented, Pacific Islanders talking about different examples, looking at the issue, of course, of decision making and local politics, and of course, bringing alive what the sustainable development goals should actually look like, and more importantly, also when they're not being respected, what, what the world looks like. So it's open for anyone for the last uh, two and a half minutes. Well, Professor. Yes, West Oahu. I, I, I was wondering if uh, where, where those uh, uh, people from Carteret island i understand they will move out somewhere and uh, are they uh, are they still maintaining their culture and or are they already synthesized with a new one okay great i think that'll be perfect for a last question and it gives enough time it looks like we have two minutes so if you'd like to respond to that hilo hi um to answer your question the uh, the people of of the cartridge atoll still sustain their culture. Um, I think as they live longer in the host community, their culture might be slightly uh, adapted. But for right now, the cultural practices 
on the islands are very strong on the atoll and also on the relocation site. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you. No, it, it's definitely an important issue that uh, the people of Kiribati and Tuvalu are looking at. They're actually looking at the migration. And uh, already Kiribati has purchased land in Fiji mm -hmm. as a last resort, but they're looking at migration with dignity as the official uh, theme that the president has been talking about, Tong, when he's talking about what's going on. And it's that they would move there, be able to farm, be able to try to maintain their culture and tradition as they went on. So that's definitely the goal of what they're looking at. It's one of the most important points when we look at the issue, especially the Sustainable Development Goal number 13 on climate change, because it's the first time ever that nations will disappear just due to a lack of action by people when we know there's an alternative. So it's really important to assess that and understand that. It's one of those issues that law schools are trying to come up with solutions. But the truth is, these SDGs are just one measurement to try to decide a new direction forward and how we should live with one another, but to recognize interconnectedness. That if we don't do action now and we let the Pacific Island nations disappear, it'll eventually impact all countries. You already see that in the United States with Hurricane Sandy. You see it, of course, in the Philippines just this time last year. So it, it really is impacting everyone now. It's not something for the future. So that's why we hope we implement these SDGs. And we'd like to thank everyone for participating and see everyone next year. Aloha. Aloha. Okay.